Keith Murray, legend, incredible solo artist, member of the equally incredible Death Squad. Death Squad. Keith Murray, welcome to the Library of Timonico. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I always like to start from the beginning. What music were you listening to as a kid? And then how did that kind of influence you as the artist today? Oh, what music I listened to as a kid? Well, take you back from the beginning. I'm from Roosevelt, Long Island, mm -hmm. like Chuck D. Public Enemy, Redman, I mean Redman. Public Enemy, Eddie Murphy, Howard Stearns. So my uncle, I'm the first grandson. And my father's name is Keith Omar Murray Sr. I'm Keith Omar Murray Jr. My uncle T-Roy, the original B-boy, taught me about hip-hop because he always was li listening to hip-hop. The first record I heard was uh, King Tim the Third and the Fatback Man. What was your reaction? You familiar with that? No, no, I should, I should oh. be though. Obviously, my reaction. The same. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. He was like, "I'm tall as a house, I'm strong as a tree. We can rock you so viciously with the bass in your face, the highs in your eyes, make your nature ride." Well, that's the Crash Crew. Right, right. That's, that's something different. That's <laughs> that was that era. Right, right. The Crash Crew. It was um, Grandmaster Fast and the Furious Five, The Message. Right. That really caught my ear. And then the first cassette I had was Run DMC, Tougher Than Leather, and the Dougie Fresh. I had the vinyl. It wasn't even really cassettes. It was vinyl, but the cassettes was there. My uncle had the Grandmaster Fast and the Furious Five, and I linked it to his friend. And when he came out, he was like, where's my cassette? I said, uh, Dave asked for it. He said, that's not your cassette. You can't give that away. <laughs> then I was like, wow, this is really sacred. My reaction was like, Uncle T-Roy, how do they do that? And then um, he was like, yo, grab a pen and write this down. Read it back to yourself and see how it sounds. It might sound like I'm just an MC, but I'm not. I'm a prince of poetry. See, I don't sit down and write rhymes every day, but people want to sound like me anyway. So, I wrote that out. I memorized it. Come to find out it was a record that he knew of. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, I'm from Roosevelt. Like I said, I was born in um, Meadowbrook Hospital, Nassau. My grandmother used to work there. So... She would go to work and I would listen to her radio. I would listen to Mega Ever College, Spectrum Sound, mm -hmm. and Mr. Magic and Red Alert on the radio. Then I start familiarizing myself with all the songs that came out that I would know verbatim. Like it wasn't a record on the radio that I, I, I would know every lyric for lyric. I was into basketball. It, this is my pre-basketball days. Right. I was in school, going to Roosevelt from Central Islip in the summer. And then I just started emulating it. I would watch how he dressed. He had the Kangos with the BVDs, with the Lee jeans, with the Pro Cads and the Three Stripe Adidas. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, him and his friend Richard, they used to be walking from the house. And I was always had to stay in the yard on Park Avenue. And I would watch them walk away. I'm looking off to the distance because I'm memorizing right, right, yeah. my childhood. <laughs> so, and then I was, you know, I just was always into the school because it was the only thing I had, like um, English, social studies, science, and gym. Then I was just sitting back in the back of the class and I would hear these words coming at me and how the sentence was formulating and the paragraphs and the similes and the metaphors and I would take the science words. My teacher, science teacher, my basketball soccer coach, Mr. Watkins, used to have these scientific words. And I knew 
at the time, UTFO was one of my biggest groups to this day, my favorite groups, and it was the educated rapper. So you had to be original. I was MC Shan and LL Cool J. They was going through their beef. Right. But I was both of them at the same time. Then the educated rapper, and I was like, I had to come original. This is when you couldn't bite. You couldn't sound like nobody else. So I was like, okay, this is, a, this is what I'm going to, I want to do this as a craft. It was way before record deal. I ever thought about the industry because there was no internet. Right. I couldn't go out to parties and stuff. So, and my parents and my grandparents, they used to have parties, but they used to play their records. The music was always around me. And then I was raised at 12 years old by the Jamaican stepfather. So the Jamaican influence came in and they used to go back and forth against each other. And they used to sing and talk about joke on each other and have fun. So I had all that culture in one. I was, I was growing up. I don't know. I probably negated your question, but no. it took me for a loop. <laughs> was that uh, was the the rapping element, the lyrical element of hip hop? Was that the only one that you kind of messed around with, or I mean, did you know you wanted to be an MC from the get go, or did you try to do break in, graph? You know. Well, good question. I used to be a part of a crew called Streetwise. And Powerful Sounds was like the older guys that was breaking and popping. I used to be a break dancer. We used to go get the aluminum, the cardboard, find out, get the cardboard, spin on that. Yeah. At the end of the at the end of the hospital grounds, at the end of my block, we used to have we used to go get mats and line them up and do backflips on the mats and stuff. So my cousin Kennedy, he's like on good close to my family. He used to call him my cousin. He still to this day, Kennedy, he was a rapper and he was a popper. And he was like, yo, well, you know, Puerto Ricans break dance. Black guys pop. You need to get into popping. So I started popping. You know what I'm saying? Then he used to be in a band at the high school and I was in junior high. And they used to be the band. I used to start breaking out. And he was like, oh, they looking at you, Murray. They looking at you. You got attention. Oh, and I was like, oh, word. I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm like, oh, this is what this is. But I was living in Suffolk, but I was from Nassau. So it was more of an all black culture. Suffolk was kind of mixed with the Puerto Ricans and the whites. We, I lived in an area called Carlton Park, the poorest income area. So they took the poor kids and mixed them with the rich kids. I used to take the bus to school. So I got a different, got started getting the culture of different ethnicity backgrounds. Like that. Uh, you obviously mentioned you're from Roosevelt. Uh, and as you mentioned, Chuck D's from Roosevelt, um, Biz Marquis, The Bomb Squad, MF Doom, EPMD, Rakam yourself. What's in the water that's that's uh, that produces these incredible artists? Must be something in the water. <laughs> and and as going up, did you? I mean, did you ever? Um, I mean, obviously, you've 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 worked, you've met and worked with those guys. Did you ever cross paths with any of them growing up? Um, was there any? I guess, well, any collaboration Father then? MC too was from there, and LL Cool J was from Bay Shore. Buster Rhymes from Uniondale. We gotta check this water. We gotta check the water. Something's in the water. <laughs> Something's in Prodigy the water. was from Hempstead. And Method Man's from Hempstead. Jesus Christ. Wow. So, it was when I was in Roosevelt, listening to the radio, I heard EPMD. And I was listening, Eric was slurring like, yo, Cold, I thought he was saying Coney Island, Long Island, but he was saying Cold Wild in Long Island with a slur. I was like, oh my God. Then I heard he said, I would stay on track like a Long Island train conductor. And Central Ice it was the train track. I was like, oh my God, he's putting it in the music. Um, is it related to me? Then Rakim was one of my biggest influences. Check out my melody. Mm. I wrote every line to the song, and I would repeat it, and I would try to rhyme. Then I was like, yo, I got mad frustrated one day. It's like, yo, I can't do this. Look at what he's doing. 
And then it was Coogee Rap, Men at Work. Coogee Rap was the one I listened to for the 16 bar structure. Mm. I wrote that out and learned it. But Rakim, when I was writing my rhymes, I was like, I can't compete with that. At one point, I was like, I have to stop doing this. But then my uncle, Born True, God Best the Dead, from Canarsie, Crown Heights, was Big Daddy Kane's bodyguard. So at a certain point, I would take the train in, in like ninth grade with my cousin Driss, God Bless the Dead, from from there back and forth, and I would be a, a fall, see Kane come through, Uncle Born, we used to be at the house playing ball, he would ride through. <clears throat> then I started getting into mathematics. Shout out to the uh, Nation of Gods and Earths. So I was in the lunchroom, he was beating on the desk, the table, boom, just was doing the beatbox, hit the beatbox, hit the, and I was rapping, I was like, yo, we gotta get Uncle Born, I think I can do this, we should get a record deal. And I started hanging with Uncle Born, he took me to Nassau Coliseum, King had a concert, it was his birthday. We went back to Canarsie at the diner over there. And then Kay was rapping, he had two girls rapping, and then I was over there eating with my cousin. And then Uncle Born had the camera, I got the video, I never brought it out. He was like, Keith, get in there. So I went over there. I saw issue with snitches, stitches. Issue with snitches, stitches. Ratches, stitches, stitches. And the king was like, holy. I was like, I'm 16. And he was like, young son, 21, undone under the sun. And then my uncle, my cousin jumped up, ran out of the, out of the diner. And then it's like, oh, he battled Kane to this day. I didn't battle him. I had the opportunity to right. rap with him. It'll come out in my documentary. Uh, speaking of Kane, uh, you, you read up on you. And it, and it does. The way that it's written, it says, you know, trading verses or battling Kane. Uh, but they refer you, you, you weren't always Keith Murray. They referred you as MC Do Damage. Uh, so who was MC Do Damage? And then how did he become Keith Murray? Carlton Park, my cousin Driss, his brother LBM. We had a grab group. I was Do Damage. He was Impact. I wrote all the rhymes very studious, wrote songs in like 10 minutes, all the songs, I didn't have, I can't, I didn't have that notebook, if I had that notebook, it'd be a classic right now, but through changing and changes, I lost the notebook, mm. but MC Do Damage was the guy who played basketball, went to school, played soccer, ran track, and wrote raps, I got a little brother, D. Murray, we shared a room, I had all the stickers of basketball, I had holes in the walls, so I would put the stickers, the, the cut out the magazines and place them on the wall to cover the holes. And then do damage was just like, yo, I do damage to MCs. And then I got with Kirk Gazelle from JVC Force, another group who made the song Strong Island. You ever heard of that? Yeah. Never heard of JVC Force? I've heard of them. I haven't heard of the song. Though. The song Strong Island was a stable. Around that time, I was like 10th, 11th grade, got with him and made a little demo. And that's when do damage emerge. That's online. If you punch it up, it's online. So then why why did you well two things. How is uh do damage different than Keith Murray, the MC? But then why did you decide to do that name change? Well, on Carlton Avenue, Carlton Park, I was MC Do Damage. Then I became I started getting into hanging out with a group of guys. We gave ourselves a name called LOD. They they named us a game. We were just a group of guys who gave ourselves an identity. After the wrestling, LOD, and the WWF, yeah. back then when it was, so it was like 30 of us. So I had the name Slash. We used to carry razors. I was in the razor cons from Brooklyn. We nicknamed ourselves after the Decepticons. Nice. So we took that. So the name do damage. After I had split up with Kirk Gazelle, was the producer, I veered off into basketball, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Then I started being a street gang, started selling hand to hand crack. I was slash, slashing people with razor blades. I'm not proud of it, nice. but that's what we did to live in the streets of Raleigh because we was born and we was in the streets. Right. But my grandmothers, my mother lived with my mother, but they had their life. That's a whole other story. But my grandmother was the one who made me be like, yo, if you're not going to school, you're not living in this house. If you're not 
on you can't be on the basketball track, soccer, and wrestling if you don't have good grades. Mm -hmm. So a school saved my life, and then hip, I was going to school to be a lawyer or a doctor in my first year of college, but then the streets got me. I got into some issues, and I had to go do a couple of months in jail. It's another story. So the name do damage from slash to do damage, then it was just Murray, 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 Keith Murray in the streets. Like I said, my father is Keith Omar Murray Sr. I'm Keith Omar Murray Jr., the firstborn grandson. So the name Murray Murray just stuck with me. Then I met Eric Sermon, and then I seen uh, Slick Rick, Ricky Walters, then I seen Redman, Reggie Noble, mm -hmm. then it was Murray, Murray, Murray. I didn't have a rap name, so it was just Keith Murray. Who you get the, the people in the streets? Oh, that's Keith Murray, Keith Murray, Keith Murray. Basketball, they were like, Murray, points, Murray, high score, all league, Murray. And then in jail when it's time for the CO to call you, like, Murray, roll up, Murray, go to court. The name Murray, Murray, Murray just stuck with me. My father's name is, uh, nickname is Bubba. They call me Keysmo in Roosevelt. So I'm really baby Bubba Keysmo, but I never had those names. Right. It just was Murray, then short Ma. So just Keith Murray. The name just rolled off the tongue, and I just ran with it, and you know, following behind my father. Before we get into, I want to talk to your debuts, but before we get into that, it, oh, part not to cut you off, it just that. organically happened. Is there a major difference between, for you, is there a major difference between Keith Murray the artist, but then Keith Murray the person? That's a great question. Now. Me, I met Eric Sermon when I was 19. I came out as an artist around 20 years old. And I was never taught how to separate the streets, the industry, my personal life. Mm -hmm. So it all tied in. That's how I became to have a black cloud over my head and develop a bad reputation. Now I'm working myself backwards. I'm a very approachable guy. Fun loving, but if you look at me and you hear stories, you would think I'm hard to be approached. So, and my music is always true to life. Mm -hmm. I've either I seen it, done it, or heard about it. It's nothing fabricated. And sometimes I had gotten to situations where I shot myself in the foot because nobody put my coattail and say, yo, listen, this is the industry. This is real life. This is music. This is real life. So I won't go back and look back in anger and change things. That's what made me who I am today. And I'm thankful for that. So every day I work hard to rectify who I am. And what got me here, because people don't know only but what you tell them. They can speculate on what they hear. I, I still want to ask you about the abuse, but uh, that brings up an interesting question for me, is that um, through trying to rectify everything, how do you, as an artist, how do you, how do you, do you, do you, do you, do you change anything about your approach to lyricism or even stuff you write? Uh, because that's, because that's, that, that's kind of, who you are, you got fans through that. So how do you balance that, those two things out? Well, I have four daughters now. And they are conscious and aware of their father. Then I don't try to change what I do, but I do try not to be as vulgar and curse as much. Mm. But I still spit the real because the music I make is really not for them, but I make songs for them. And I cover a lot of points on the spectrum of uh, my style and personality. I'm a Gemini. I have two personalities, but I hear a person has 28 personalities, and I'm a character. Mm. So I, um, I'm kind of conscious, but... Sometimes I ask myself, should I give a fuck? Because right. I really don't give a fuck. Right. And fuck you very much. And 
Uh, never met you and hope the pleasure of never meeting you. But at the same time, I do have a heart and I do care. But being nice and get you nowhere, but you get further with sugar than shit. Mm. So it's not how you say it. What you say is how you say it. I understand that now. Right. But I'm not going to kiss ass to be approved. And I understand that you can't please everybody. Mm. So... Take it as you are, but I'm a very, I believe in the good karma and all existence in the universe, and you get out what you put in. So I keep a conscious mind of that, but I really don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about debut. So uh, you, debated, you debuted on Eric Sherman's album, uh, No Pressure, and then you debated, debuted on your own album as a solo project, and then you debuted as a part of a group, Def Squad. Uh, mm. Walk me through I the- I like the way you did, that's a trilogy. I was trying to- <laughs> Def Squad is a trilogy too. But walk me through like the mindset of an artist that's, well, one's debuting on someone's album, then two debuting on his own album, and then three debuting as mm. part of a whole group. Never looked at it like that. Is, it, is there a different mindset in terms of attacking a track or- Well. Everything I've done, I've been groomed to do because I've been doing it since I was, like, before... I started at 12, but before then, I was groomed into the music, so I was, like, in training, and then I geared up. So um, it was, like, um, unconsciously, I meshed organically into who I am. Because I was with Eric Sermon for two years before I even got in the studio on the microphone. I would go see him. He would play the beats in the music room. I would see the hit squad coming around. I'm going on tour and I'm going back to the block, back to school, back to the block, back to the life of Raleigh, figuring out my life. Then I came out on his song, Hostile, No Pressure. Right. Keith Murray's coming from the North, South, East, and West, rhyming to death, making the world want to take a deep breath. So we did the song, we did the video. It was on his tape. And then Russell uh, was like, why you took him to Chive? You should have took him to me, Eric told me. But I, I, I got to give it all to Eric Servant. He knew the vision. I had just a bunch of rhymes. He broke them down, told me not to say so much in the line. Mm -hmm took lines out of what I was saying, made them the hooks, and that's how I came out with the most beautiful thing in this world. In the song, Hostile, I said, the most beautiful thing in this world is my notion for murderous poetry emotion. Eric said, yo, say the most beautiful thing in this world, pause, just like that, pause, I get in you. I was in there for 30 minutes arguing with E, like, yo, I cannot say this. It's just not rhythmatically in my brain to say it. Right. We was in there tussling to this day is my biggest record. That was actually one of my questions about that line. But um, but before before we move on about uh, talk about your solo albums, um, uh, no pressure will turn twenty five tomorrow. Uh, for you, what say that again. No pressure will be hit, hit its twenty fifth anniversary tomorrow. Oh, for real? Yeah, I'm gonna age all of us. Um, That's nice. So, so what? What influence or what impact? Uh, Twenty five years later, would no pressure have for you? Then also, what impact does no pressure have for hip hop culture? That's crazy because that was the time when Eric Sermon was splitting with EPMD. The incident had occurred. I was the one who was at the house with Eric when the DTs came to the house. He thought it was the realtor. I said, no, that's Detectives, Eric. I'm from Central Rights of the Block. I know that guy. <laughs> so um, it was when Eric was splitting with EPMD, he moved to Atlanta. And it was for him, no pressure was saying, there's no pressure for him to go solo and uh, resume his career. Right. So, for me, I was just following suit. I was just happy to be there. 
You know what I'm saying? And I didn't know the impact it would make on the world because I didn't, I never seen a producer that raps on the mic. It was always somebody producing somebody. Right. He would make the beats, get on the microphone. And I'm sitting there like, look at this. What is this? He was like Stevie Wonder to me. Incredible. Um, go to your album, The Most Beautiful Thing in This World. Uh, released November 1994. Other albums released at this time. Nas is Omatic. Biggie's Ready to Die. Outcast is Southern Playlistic. OC's World, Word, Life. Gangstar's Hard to Earn. P-Rock and CL Smooth is the main ingredients. Incredible year for hip-hop. Method Here, Man to Cow. Incredible year for hip-hop. Um, Tom and Resurrection, Scarface, The, uh, the mm. Diary. Um, mm. As an... MC, what is the conversation that's happening within the hip hop community about this year and the album releases? And then also, as an MC that's about to release an album, is there pressure to top any of these guys, or is that that's not even thought of? It was no conversation. It was unnatural progression. I was friends with Nas at the time because he came to the studio and Eric Sermon was producing the record and Nas was like, oh, that's homeboy. And then he was showing me love, I was showing him love. Me and Biggie Smalls was close, closer at the time. I remember coming from uptown, reing up with my friend uh, Horse and my cousin Axe and this little Acura, we get off at Gates Avenue, Biggie would be staying on the block. I come out the car, he'd be like, hey, what's this surprise? Because Puffy, Eric, Puffy produced a video for E, hitting switches. He did that video, and I just was there with Biggie on the side, and we was, like, I had weed, and then we became friends because I had weed, and I was with Eric. And then, um, I was with Nas early on. He would hang out. He would drop me off at the house in Long Island and things of that nature. So it was no discussion. I just was was doing what was natural. Eric knew what was going on with Jive, and he had the Def Jam thing with Redman. But me, I just was the one who had the rhymes and always was prepared to spit at any given time with a unique style that nobody ever heard of before. Oh, speaking of which, are you? Do you have the beats already created in your mind of what kind of beats you want to spit over, or is it just kind of listening to a bunch of beats and finding that exact the right fit? Nope. Oh, Eric Sermon <laughs> told me Keith Murray, don't come over here if you don't have no rhymes. He always had beats, so he would say rap to this, rap to that, rap to this. I would go in the booth and I would spasmatic. And the most beautiful thing in the world was the remix that came out. He had an original beat to it, but he flipped it and put my vocals on that beat. Him to being the genius he is made it more commercial. So I never second guess Eric to this day. He says, this is the beat, you rap to it. And it do what it do organically. Uh, obviously the, the, the single, the most beautiful thing in this world, uh, obviously incredible song, but also an incredible hit. Uh, you talk to artists about their hit records, and they always talk about a gift and a curse of the record. Has there been a gift, and, gift, the gift and the curse for this record? Yeah, the gift was having the talent. The curse was not having the caretakers to teach me about the business. Mm. I had the music, but the business is what thrives the artist to live and be successful by the grace of God, I was never taken advantage of. I always was able to follow the dollar. Eric gave me all my publishing. You know what I'm saying? So I had a group of individuals that I brought along with me that didn't know the industry. I love them to this day. You know what I'm saying? But I could have been a billionaire way before than I'm going to be coming up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I don't never beat myself up over it. Look, in hindsight, I'm an artist. I don't look back in anger. 
You know what I'm saying? It's by the grace of God I'm here on the wing of the prayer as it is. I could have been dead or in jail for life right now by the naive things I did as a young kid, uh, not knowing things. You know what I'm saying? I don't be beating myself up or mad at people that didn't put my coattail. You learn the world as you go along. You know? They don't know. How they going to know? They didn't know. So, yeah, I don't, I don't regret it. So I have this weird, uh, I don't know, thing where I, 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 I notice so kind of certain lyrics that pop out to me in, in songs. And, and in a lot of rap songs, uh, Stevie Wonder's name is mentioned. Uh, DMX does it. Uh, Dress from Black Sheep does it. You do it on, on, on your, your first album. Uh, what is the influence that Stevie, well, what's the influence that Stevie Wonder has had on you as an artist, but also as a person? Um, First of all, the man can't see. The man can play instruments out of this world. He's an artist. He's made a big impact. Actually, I bumped into him one day at the airport, and his caretaker saw me. And I was like, oh, wow, Stevie Wonder. And then his man was like, Stevie, is Keith. He was like, oh, the most beautiful thing in this world. I was shocked. Wow. I got his on my Instagram page. Keith Murray Instagram, go wow. check that out. I got a drop. It's Keith Murray, Stevie Wonder, no foul out, lose the blunt. He's like, Keith, all right, all right. I was like, thanks, man. And I was just standing there like, holy shit. Stevie Wonder know me. He can't even see. So what the fuck do I care about a hater got to say? <laughs> Stevie Wonder know me. The key in life. I was in jail listening to where was you at when I needed you last winter. Watching young Stevie. He know Keith Murray. Thank you for that question. Because I would walk out of here with my head up and I'll go conquer the world right now. Uh -huh. Another thing you do that I think is incredible for a, solo, for a debut solo album is that you actually say the line, Yo E, this might be my last album. And for some, I think for some, any artist, any, any listener here, someone who's coming out with their debut album would say, this might be my last album, is a ballsy thing to say. Did you think it was that ballsy when you said it? And what, why did you say it? Because I didn't know what life was going to come at me when I walked out of that studio. Because I was a safe haven in the studio. Once I walked out that studio, it could be a free accident. You could get hit by a stray bullet. You could have done something to somebody or somebody who crew you did something to that came and did something to you. So I was a depressed individual. And he was like, yo, why are you so depressed? You're Keith Murray. My father passed away. My mother passed away. I'm living this life of Riley. I'm not knowing the future because I didn't know. Read the book, all you need to know about the music industry. I've been put with the lawyers, the Mark McCrayo and the, the Larry Rudolph and... Puffy lawyer, Matt lawyer, and Britney Spears lawyer manager around these people. And I'm over here like, yo, my friends are dying left and right, getting shot, killing people. I don't know what's going to happen. Yo, E, this might be my last album, son, for real. Because when I got coming in here, giving all those emotions out, telling my real life story. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I have two grandmothers, Buddha and Dolly May. 82 and 85, and they uh, teach me about God and spirituality, and I'm, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus, and I know I'm ordained now. I didn't know then. So I said it might be the conjunction word indicates an either or. But you heard the ad lib. He was like, hell no. Yeah, right, yeah. And the she was like, but when I heard it, I just kind of, I had to play it a few times to make sure I heard it correctly. I was like, that's a... Ballsy thing to say, though. You know, you're coming out with your new uh, one solo Speaking album. Speaking from the heart when my emotions are must leave. Um, and, if, and, of course, it wasn't your last album. But then, of course, you are a part of this incredible group, uh, Def Squad, uh, which I think is interesting because the name Def Squad is first mentioned in 94 um, in, your, in music. And then, but the album didn't come out until 98. Uh, why the delay between the, uh, uh, the name mentioned in 94 and the album? release in 98. Well, Def Squad is a group of individuals who came together under the wing of Eric Sermon. Redman was acquired from New Jersey through me and DJ Scratch and EPMD. Keith Murray asked K. Sola to take me to Eric Sermon. 
I was around Red Man because Eric Sermon was producing Red Man. So we was brothers. Before we formulated a crew, we started being on each other records because Eric would put me on the same album title uh, songs as Red Man on his album, on Eric's album. Then Red Man was doing stuff so Eric would feature me. Then Keith Murray was doing stuff so Eric paired us together. And then we just meshed as brothers. It was never going to be three dudes in a group. Then Eric split with EPMD, and his sister Miki came up with the name Def Squad after Def Jam, D-E-F, most definitely dope. Some people used to think it was D-E-T-H, Death, but it was most definitely high definition. You know what I'm saying? So the album El Nino came together because Def Jam felt that when we did Rap is Delight, from that album um, that all the rappers did of the old school rap, it just met so well. Me, Eric and Red, Big Bang Hank, uh, Wonder Mike, you know what I'm saying? And then it was the young one, Keith Murray. It just went so well and then they talked about it and they put us together and then it happened like that. That's why it never was a, a Death Squad 2. We had three solo artists, solo careers that took us in different directions, but we're brothers at the end of the day. We all know each other's mothers and the families know each other and the kids know each other. It's a family. It's not just a group of individuals that came together to make music and make money together. That's why you never see Death Squad talking disrespectful about each other right. or having quarrels in the media and then getting back together. Because at the end of the day, we always solo anyway and brothers by the grace of God. Uh, I would have to ask, would, will there ever be a Death Squad uh, 2? I mean, is that ever going to be in the works or just kind of more of an organic thing? If it happens, it happens. It has to be organic. We never was going to do it in the first place. People was rooting for it. They went platinum. We never had a Death Squad tour. If we have a Death Squad reunion tour, it would be the biggest thing since sliced bread. But at the same time, we don't want to force nothing. We don't want to have no obligations with each other. But at the end of the day, we have each other backs. And if it happens, it happens. I want to see it happen. You know, Eric want to see it happen. Red Man want to see it happen. But how do you get three-headed monsters in the same room together like that? All right. I want to ask you, uh, so you've released about six albums. When we personally don't need it. Right. But we want it. You needs and wants are two different things. Excuse me. Now, uh, you've released six albums. Um, 1994 was the first. But you've always... I did? That's what, uh, that's what uh, all music says. Yeah, I, I, I'm joking. <laughs> I really released like three albums, but the other ones came about. Right. Um, <laughs> but but well, what's interesting is we're in, we're, in a, uh, we're in the day and age where... Uh, an artist has but to. I got all my publishing and everything, and it came out right. And, and, and you know, it's not a mistake, but it wasn't like the first most beautiful and enigma. And then it's a beautiful thing is when I went to jail and came out, and the album was released. Right. Then I came back, got my footing right, but that's a whole other interview. Do you, uh, with with the day and age where where uh, an artist releases an album and then has to release an album five minutes later, uh, do you now as a as someone who continues to write and do music, do you feel that pressure to have to constantly release music uh, to quote unquote stay relevant? I never looked at the whole relevancy thing. It's organic. I do take my artistry serious, but at the same time, it's a feeling. And, you know, like I said, I grew up in public. I really was never taught about this music than business so it's really no pressure on me and you know it's, you eat what you kill in this society in this world so if you want to come out and do albums every year and do that and you focus with teams that people a lot of people eat off of you and you're uh, you know you're part of that team and then you have to look back at saying people jerk me for my money and I never had that problem because I'm just, you know, 
figured the world out and now I move forward, but no, I put my best foot forward and I know I got a lot of fans out there and I owe them new music to continue my legacy to when I'm not able to make records and do tours and shows, have something to fall back on. Stay in the loop now as a new age. Get in the loop and play the game as it's played and finish strong and open the gate for new artists and start your company and give these other artists and producers and other business people and cross collaborate with corporations and be a grown man at the end of the day and know you did the right thing before your time is up on this planet Earth responsibly. So does that mean a new Keith Murray albums? Well, I have a streaming album online now called The Lord of the Metaphor. It's on Def Squad streaming. It's collectively 12 songs that was never released or coded that Eric Sermon, Mickey Knox, and Minza at Def Squad put together for the Keith Murray fans. Now, I have another group of songs that me and Eric have done over the last 10 years that never came out because of me finding my footing again and coming out the right way as a businessman called The Most Ugliest Thing in This World. It's coming out on Death Squad streaming in a couple of months from now, produced by Eric Sermon. Then I'm going to pull my sleeves up, go through my notes, look at E, look at our history, and to come out with the most beautiful thing in the world, part two. Should be coming out within a year or two from now. Oh, it's organic. It's there. Just sit down and buckle down and see what's going on. But it's ABC one, two, three. I'm uh, trained for this, baby. <laughs> I'm ready. I still get in you. So I have to ask you, uh, you you've obviously been doing this for a while and you've written a shitload of music. Um, is there kind of that verse that you've written or still writing that you look at it and you say, oh, shit, I can't believe I wrote that. And if there is, is there something you could share with us? Yes. Well, like to reiterate myself, when I went to Eric Sermon's house and he heard a lot of the rhymes I had, he seen my work ethic, but he told me, Murray, don't come back over here if you ain't got no rhymes. So I went back, banged my head on the wall, went back to E, and I came out with Y'all mythological rappers is comical. The astronomical be coming through like the flu, bombing you and then bombing in your crew too. With the musical, mystical, magical, you know how I do. With word attack skills, vocabulary too. Competition, the disedition is all brand new. You're through. I'm interplanetarian like Dr. Who. Who? 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 Wanna get tripped on? Word is born. I'm kicking rhymes to the AM Vulture Swarm. Not Quincy Jones, but I'm back on the block. I sell him crack because he came out with the album back on the block. Not Quincy, but I'm back on the block. And not selling crack because when I came out, I was selling crack, but I came out musically now. Not Quincy, but I'm back on the block and not selling crack. Ooh. That blew me away just now. I didn't even finish the run. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, on that note, uh, Keith Murray, uh, honor to have spoken to you today on the Library of Timonico. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me.